Hello, Physics 131. Welcome. It's 11.10. It's uh, Wednesday morning here in Toronto. It's uh, nice and sunny out there and a little cool. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, okay, so here we are in uh, class three. And today's plan is we're going to get into, we're going to do some more vector math, um, position, displacement, distance, and path length. I'm going to go over that, um, hopefully uh, clear up some of the issues there. We're going to talk about motion with constant velocity, a little bit about um, motion with constant acceleration. Just make sure I'm viewing this Q&A. There's always these uncomfortable pauses while I fuss around with my technology. As we're... That goes there. Um, participants, I can see there's now 730 of you on the call. So amazing. Welcome, welcome. And the q and I'll put right there. Okay, so I can see those. Okay, um, I wanted to start with this announcement that you should have received an email now um, from this Learning Assistance Alliance, um, and there's a link there. The, this is how we're administering the pre and post diagnostic tests for this course, which you do online. The first test is called the Force Concept Inventory. It's a very famous test about, uh, about acceleration and forces and how we think about these things. It's, it's, it's a physics test, but um, it's, it's written in plain language. You don't have to study ahead. In fact, please don't study ahead for it. I just want your honest answers about what you, th what you think the answers to these are. The other one is called the Colorado Learning um, uh, Assess, sorry, Learning Attitudes About Studying Science Test. I think that's how it stands for. It's about um, people's attitudes about what science is and how you study for, uh, for a physics course and what the point of a physics course is. And then we're going to be doing something very similar at the end of the course and see, see how the course kind of uh, affects your ideas about physics and about, about learning. Um, someone is asking, uh, wasn't 2.6 and 2.7 supposed to be covered on Friday, Monday? So yes, I'm a little bit ahead of the uh, schedule that I posted. That's a, that's a good point. Um, my plan is to spend more time on Friday actually doing some actual problems and showing you how to solve the problems that are going to be in the quiz. So Friday will be hopefully a little bit more of a practice lecture. So that's sort of my, I want to go over these concepts so you understand the concepts first, and then we're going to try to start practicing actually solving things once those concepts are more solid in our mind. So that's a great question. Um, both these, um, going back to the uh, learning assistant email, both these tests are optional and your accuracy on the test will not affect your mark in the course in any way. But there is a deadline, which you have to do it by Friday. And to encourage you to do the tests, you're gonna receive one homework credit for each of these surveys that you complete. So right now you can get two homework credits just for going and, and doing these two surveys, the FCI and the class. And there'll be two more, so uh, at the end of the semester, so for four total. You get, so to, to repeat, you get uh, credit for participation in the surveys, but your accuracy does not matter. But I do encourage you to do your best. Um, I think it's two different links. One of them is a bunch of physics questions. There's 30 physics questions. The other one, I think it's a similar number, but there are questions just about sort of, do you agree with these statements about, about science? Also, you may notice if you go on that same page where you can see the video recordings, um, today, just this morning, I, I posted uh, a video. It's just, it starts with me and my bike. Basically, I was having, I was in office hours yesterday from, from three to four in the gather town. And it's a bit crazy. You have to walk around with the arrow keys but four people found me. It was, uh, I think it was Morgan and Perry and Catherine and Marianne found me and were chatting. And, you know, people were in one of, I think Catherine was 12 time zones away or something. So I was getting this impression that a lot of you didn't really even, hadn't really even been down St. George Street. And so, so this is why I thought maybe it'd be nice to just do a little video. So I go, in the video I walk in, it's a seven minute video. I walk into the physics building and give you a quick tour. And 
I just did it with my iPhone on selfie mode. So the videography is very terrible and you know, it's very shaky and stuff, but maybe, and it's totally optional, you don't have to watch it. I'm masked up for most of, most of it as well. Um, let me just, yeah, nobody's got their hands up. Okay. And this, there's a link there to, if you feel like watching it. Last class on Monday, at the end of class, I asked, does constant velocity imply constant acceleration? And the answer to that question is yes. In fact, it also implies that there's zero acceleration. So this, um, the, and then the other question is, does constant acceleration imply constant velocity? And the answer is no, unless that constant happens to be zero. So constant changing accelera acceleration normally means constantly changing velocity. So in physics, uh, I mean, in life, I guess, when you see something moving, you think, oh, it's got velocity. The faster it's moving, the higher it's velocity. The faster it's accelerating, maybe the higher it's velocity. And I think people use these two um, words, velocity and acceleration, to mean almost the same thing. Just if it's big, it's fast. But in physics, that's not the case. Velocity is all about how fast it's going, and acceleration is very different. It's this rate of change of, um, of velocity. And so I might as well just quickly do a little quick um, demo. Uh, if you don't mind. Back to that track with the, uh, the penguin. So let's see if I can point it over here. Here we are again. <laughs> And there's my penguin again, which I'm going to set up to go click, click, click. And let's see if I can try to show constant acceleration and constant velocity. Um, so. And I'll try to talk kind of loud because I know that um, my microphone is, is, uh, is on the laptop there. But let's set up the tick, tick, ticks on the penguin. And let's try to do constant velocity, zero acceleration. That would be just a cart rolling along a flat track. <laughs> so the idea there, constant velocity. So these should be equally spaced. Now they're not equally spaced. <laughs> I think, and actually you can see there's a bit of a slope there. But the idea is if there's no kind of horizontal forces on the cart, then you'll have constant velocity. And forces is a chapter three concept, we'll get into that a little more later. So Pius has set up a little fan on this. So if I turn this fan on, it blows air. And what the, sorry, what the fan does is it creates a constant uh, pushing force on the cart. So I can even start the cart almost at rest. We can try to do the same thing with bean bags and show constant acceleration by turning on the fan. <laughs> okay, there was a collision there. <laughs> but now you can see on the motion diagram here, what happened is that the spacing of the bean bags got bigger and bigger, but at a kind of a constant rate. So that's constant acceleration and a constantly increasing velocity. All right, <laughs> so that's the, that's the demo of the day. And it sort of worked, I guess. Let me go back to my screen share. Once again, every time I do this, it messes up all my Zoom windows. So please, patience. Q&A is there. Participants is there. I think that's all I need. Scroll through this Q and A. Hmm. So, if you didn't get the email yet uh, about that, um, those those uh, pre and post courses, so pre and post diagnostic quizzes, that means that probably your email wasn't included. So you're going to just have to send an email again to the Physics 131 Fall at Physics and ask to update the email and I can, I can put that in and we can hopefully do that before Friday. So you should have gotten it. If not, we're gonna have to fix something. Okay. All right, so 
let's keep going. Um, let's talk about vectors. So there's two kinds of numbers. There's scalars and vectors. A scalar is just a single number, something that you can type into your calculator and add and subtract, just like you've always done, like two or 2.5, these are scalars. And you can, a scalar quantity is something like mass, uh, temperature, volume. These are quantities that can just be specified by one number. In the case of temperature, it might be plus or minus. Um, in the case of mass, that's a, that can only be positive, I guess. Um, same with volume. But the point is, it's just a number. A vector is something that has both a magnitude and a direction. And the geometric representation of a vector is an arrow with the tail of the arrow placed at the point where the measurement is made. Um, actually, you know what? I'm not looking at the chat. Where it's going. Yeah, um, I try, so this is a, there's a comment in the chat saying, we don't have any of these slides. It is true that um, I did not post some of these slides beforehand. When I do the pre-class slides, I do a lot of updates as I'm um, working on it. So they end up kind of different. I will post the slides after class though. And hopefully it's not annoying that the, the slides posted, not too annoying. <laughs> the slides posted before and after are a bit different. And the lecture is recorded, so you'll, you'll see this on the YouTube later if you want. So the vector, here's a vector, it's a velocity vector. And so it's named V, gives a little arrow on top of it, V for velocity. The vector is drawn across the page, but it represents this particle's velocity at this one point. So this shows where the particle is, and then there's this sort of abstract idea that the arrow represents First of all, the direction shows the direction that it's going, um, so where it'll be a little later. And then the length of this arrow uh, indicates the magnitude of the vector. And this is, if this is five meters per second, it's this long. If it was going twice as fast at 10 meters per second, then we would draw an arrow that is twice as long. And there's, sometimes people use R or D uh, for position. Um, v for velocity usually, A for acceleration. Um, and these are all different quantities, all of which are uh, vectors. There's two kinds of things. Something can be a vector quantity or it can be a scalar quantity. So let's do a poll. Which of the vectors in the second row shows A plus B? There's A, there's B. Um, here's a bunch of different options for which would be the sum of those two vectors. So let's launch polling. Another uh, 10 seconds to click in, please. My hope is in the future, I wanna have some small group discussions during these polls, but I don't know how to do that, so. In a couple of weeks, we'll figure it out. Okay, so results of the poll were that 50% of you voted for, uh, for C and 15% voted, for, or sorry, 28% voted for D. Let's take a look at what uh, my thoughts are for that. So I like C, that was my answer. Um, and the way, again, to add two vectors is you redraw them. Both of these are emanating from this point, uh, the same point, A and B. So you have to redraw them. Uh, if you do A plus B, you connect B to A and then 
the, I guess the resultant or A plus B is going to be the vector that starts at the, at the tail of A and goes to the tip of B when you line them up like that. So um, Christian, you've had your hand up for a little bit. So I'm going to unmute you. Do you have a question? Christian, hello? Cannot hear you. Hello, Christian? Must be a problem with your microphone. I think I'm going to go uh, to the next hand, which is uh, Florence. Hi, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you have a question? Okay, so um, I had a question about the vector arrow signs on top. Um, mm -hmm. Will this course have a lot of emphasis on it? Because um, the textbook itself doesn't really have a huge emphasis on it. It says that it has the arrows, but then when they talk about velocity versus speed, they don't really put an arrow over top. Hmm. So um, I was just wondering if the course will be like, if that'll be an important part, I guess. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's a great question. To me, it is kind of important, but I'll tell you, I do sometimes forget to put the little arrow on top of uh, vector quantities sometimes. When, when I'm reading through the book, I usually see they're pretty careful about it um, because it's something very different, right? Velocity mm -hmm. is B with a little arrow on top of it. So I can, oops, I can just sort of draw that here. Um, so this is a vector quantity, velocity. And when you talk about the magnitude of velocity, V, you can just take off the arrow and talk about speed. So it seems like a minor change to leave off the arrow, but it does, it does have some significance. So I'd say it's fairly important. It's a good okay. Question. Thank you. Sure. Um, <laughs> someone asked, uh, why is the letter R used for position? I don't know. I guess sometimes uh, when you're drawing polar vectors on like with a theta and then some length, people use R as being the distance from an origin. So that's sometimes why you see R. Going back to this. Okay. Uh, and then going back to this conceptual description of motion from last time, I thought I would show you this sled. And again, this isn't in the pre-course slides, but bear with me. To use a motion diagram, you'd like to know where the object is and when it was at that position. So position measurements, like here's this R, can be made by laying a coordinate system uh, grid over a motion diagram. So here's this idea of keeping track of an angle and a, and a distance from the origin. So here's a sled going down a hill and it's, ex it's speeding up, kind of like that uh, cart with the fan on it was speeding up. In this case, there's no fan, it's just gravity which is speeding up down the hill. Um, but what's interesting about this is that we can look at the change in the object's position. So to show a change in position, what you do is like, say we wanna know the change in position between uh, three seconds and four seconds, these two dots here. Well, you talk about the sled's displacement vector. Sometimes you, know, you use delta D or delta R, but the point is that um, it is the difference between, so I can write it here, I guess, uh, delta R, oops, delta. We put the arrow sign on the R, not the delta. Uh, delta R is equal to, it's going to be the, the final position minus the initial position. So it'll be R4 minus R3. That's that delta R between those two places. And you can also write it, the way I like to, to write it is that the initial position, R3, sorry, the final position, speaking too fast here, the final is the initial plus the change. So R4 is equal to whatever the initial position was plus the delta R. I find that a little easier to remember. And then when you sort of solve that out, you can get what the delta R is. It's, it's the final minus the initial. So getting back into a bit of the vector math here, um, we talked about vector addition and vector sub subtraction last time. There's also, a, uh, you can multiply a vector by a scalar. 
And when you do that, the result is a vector that is parallel or anti-parallel to the original vector. Magnitude equals the product of the magnitude of the vector times that scalar. So example, here's A going uh, in this direction, it has some magnitude. When you do B is C times A, where C is a little uh, scalar, then it just stretches the length of A in that direction. Okay? And you can have a negative scalar, like here, here's A, and you multiply it times negative two, you get a vector which is the opposite direction of A, and since it was negative two, you'd have twice the, twice the length. So I have another poll question for you. Uh, which of these vectors in the second row shows 2A minus B? Think about this one. Let me launch the poll. Okay, another five seconds to click in and we'll see what results are. Okay, do end polling. So 65% of you said A and 22% um, of you said B. Um, let's take a look what I was thinking there. So I was thinking A as well. So what you do, um, the first thing you're going to do is take the vector a and change it to 2a, so make it twice as long. So that would take it out in that direction. And then if you want to subtract b, what you do is you add negative b to that vector. And again, it's this tip-to-tail method. So you line up the, the tail of that second vector to the tip of that first vector, and then the sum goes from all the way from the beginning of the first vector to the end of the second vector. So it's gonna go quite a ways up and a little bit over to the right. I think A was definitely the answer there. B is a pretty good um, choice, but I just think that when you multiply A times two, it's, it should be a little longer there. So it was a bit of a tricky one. Um, <laughs> There's also a trapezoid rule of how you can add vectors. That's fine too. I'm just using tip to tail to show you a little bit. Are A plus B and B plus A different? Turns out no. I mean, I guess it, you do it a different way, but you always get the same answer. So vector addition is commutative. Um, Sam Farza, do you want to ask a question? Your hand is up. So yeah, the, on the previous slide, you showed a scalar multiplying a vector and it was like a negative. Um, but the way that it would, yeah, the way it shows it is like, the the tail starts where the a where the oh. <laughs> yeah so that's a good point so i don't know why they did that um but the idea is that a vector is has has just a magnitude and a direction and the starting place you can put it anywhere you want on your diagram it's not part of what the vector represents okay so on a graph it would be that you would put the the A arrow on the end of where the tail of the negative two A arrow is? Well, kind of depends what you're doing, but I, I think if I was drawing this, I would draw them both emanating from the origin, just because that's, that's kind of easier to show it, right? Okay. But um, you can put it wherever you want. Here, what they've, what looks like what they're almost trying to do is add A, you know, plus negative two A, because they're, they're pretty close there. But, but the okay. position that you, what I'm trying to say is that once you've got a vector, it has a direction, it has a magnitude, but it's the same vector no matter where you put it on your graph. Okay, thank you. No? Yeah. 
Great, thanks for thanks for tripping in. And actually, Caitlin, you also have. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry, I didn't know my hand was raised. Don't. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think once you raise it, you have to go click unraise hand or something like that. To, uh... Okay. Oh, so I'm, oh. <laughs> okay, so this is this is a little aside. We're at, we're at about halfway through this class, so I just thought I'd um, tell you a little story if you want to bear with me. Um, and it's going to get back to physics at the end. So it all started with um, I went to Manitoulin Island this summer and for about a week, and we have uh, a hamster and a bunch of plants. And so my daughter Taryn, who's 24, was house sitting for us. So anyway, we returned from Manitoulin and I found out after a while that she had left herself logged into Crave TV. So we've been watching her Crave. And uh, I have two little kids, Zainab, who you saw before, and, and Mirage, who are six and nine. They were on the Crave and they're looking around for kids shows. And they found this show from 1971 called The House of Frightenstein. This is a really terrible old Canadian show and it's got all this, these like live actors and makeup doing these scary things or saying scary poems or something. There's the Count, uh, the, I don't know who this guy is. There's, you know, Boris, there's Griselda the Witch, there's Wolfman and all that. Um, and then, so I was kind of watching this and the kids are on the couch and they're kind of like hiding under a blanket watching this stuff. And then this guy comes on um, and he kind of, he looks just like this and he says, hello, my name is Julius. Sumner Miller, I'm a physics professor and I am real. I don't know what I'm doing in this house of horrors. But today I want to talk to you about sound. Sound is a compression wave in the air. And here I have two metal pipes, two pipes. One is metal, one is cardboard. And he goes on and on to just talk. He gives actually a very interesting uh, physics lesson about uh, standing waves and tubes of air and how they amplify certain frequencies. And then goes back, the next one is again, Griselda the witch doing something. And so I kind of, and he has no makeup or anything. And I sort of realized like, and the kids are still under the, you know, blankets like scared looking up, is that maybe one of our deepest fears is learning. And so here you guys are, I can see that there's 806 of you on this call <laughs> and I'm the physics professor. And so I want to commend you for your courage and thank you for being here. And I guess I also want to say that I don't want physics to be scary. And uh, you know, a lot of my office hours are talking about significant digits and how we're gonna penalize you for significant digits. I, I can sense that, that you know, natural kind of fear coming from a lot of you. So um, it's normal, but please, you know, please believe me, I'm here to have fun. And I'm here to try to help the world be a better place through, through, uh, through physics. Someone, uh, Luco says he remembers watching the show. <laughs> That's good. It is a weird show. Okay, so we're going to get on to um, uh, back to chapter two. So this is pretty simple. Quantities for describing motion. One is time. So time is what time it is on a clock, and the time interval is you know t two minus t one. Delta t is the difference in two clock readings. So again, delta means change in, and it's the final minus the initial value. So those are both scalar quantities. And the stopwatch can be used to measure the time interval. And the SI unit for time is seconds. Okay, so here's this whole dilemma about position, displacement, distance, and path length. So I'll try to draw this out for you. Um, position is an object's location in a certain coordinate system. Um, displacement is a vector that starts at an object's initial position and ends at its final position. And distance is the magnitude of the displacement. And then path length is how far an object actually moved as it traveled from its initial position to its final position. And I think a lot of textbooks call distance path length the same thing, just distance, but they're a bit careful in this book to distinguish that. So. If you move, imagine laying a string along the path or a line of breadcrumbs or something, the length of the string uh, is the path length. The best way to do this is with a little example, I think. So you've got a car, um, which I'll draw here. Whoops. It always, 
mute your phone when you're doing a, a lecture. <laughs> okay, so here's a car. It's, it backs up. Let me draw it here. Um, it starts at this position, which I'm going to call X initial, initial position. Then it backs up to the origin. But that doesn't matter because we're just going to drop final initial positions. And then eventually moves forward again, goes back through its initial position again, and ends up right here. And this is X final. So we say the car moves to here eventually. It starts there, backs up, and X initial and X final, those might be the only things that matter in this problem, and the fact that it went back and forth um, doesn't affect the initial and final positions. Displacements. So again, here it is. So this is, it backed up, but if you go from X initial and you end up at X final, then the displacement over that motion is simply this vector right here. And we call that vector D with an arrow on top. You could call it R, but we'll call it D. And then um, the distance D is just equal to the absolute value of X final minus X initial, where D is always going to be a positive number. And then just to finish this up, uh, path length, that is a little different. So then what you do is you take into account the fact that the car went back here, turned around, and went all the way up to here. So there's X initial, um, there's X final, and uh, L is this distance. L is going to be, first of all, this distance, which is going to be, you know, X initial, the minus zero. And then it's gonna be plus um, this whole distance, X final minus zero. So it's gonna be uh, just X initial plus X final in this case, the total distance to travel. So this is where you take into account the fact that it actually moved back to the origin before it went uh, back to X final. Take a quick look at the people are. I don't think it was ACDC, it was, uh, it was actually, I had cashmere, my Led Zeppelin on the thing. My, my lights, let me turn the lights on, I have to move. <laughs> You don't move enough in these lab rooms, the lights go off to save energy. So, um, Let's see who else. Yeah, at the top of my list now. Do you have a question? You're unmuted. Yes, yeah, so can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, it's the thing is that uh, what we learn in high school, this thing is the, like the ground, the thing covered. But uh, in this task book, it's that the, this thing, uh, the absolute value, which is the magnitude of the of the uh, displacement, so which one is right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just two different conventions, isn't it? They're both, um, I guess, valid ways of describing the motion. The motion is what it is. Um, actually, I, I had the same uh, convention in high school. That the distance was the path length. That it sort of is the distance that the car traveled, right? If it was, if, especially if it was moving and did a U-turn and came back, then the odometer reading would give the path length. So, so it's a question of notation and different textbooks have different notation. So in this course and in this, when, when we say the word distance, what we mean is the magnitude of the displacement. It's not the same as the path length, which is how far the thing went. Just try to remember that convention for this course. Uh -huh. So if the thing like is traveling in a circle and to back to its origin, so that both the displacement and the distance is zero, right? <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> you would think the distance to travel is the circumference of the circle, but the, the distance being the, the magnitude of the displacement is zero if it went all the way around. And the path length is the circumference of the circle. Okay. It's a bit odd, this notation, but I think you'll get used to it. And I, I think it, uh, okay. it's not too hard. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure, thanks for that. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, let's continue right along here. So now we know about um, 
position, we can look at velocity. So velocity is the slope of the position versus time graph. And I went over this a little bit last time. So, um, and slope can be found by, I guess, rise over run. If the slope is positive, the object is moving in the plus x direction. If the slope is negative, then the object's moving in the negative x direction. Uh, the magnitude of the slope um, is the speed of the object. And if you do the speed together with the direction, you've got a, a vector, which is the, the velocity, which in, in one dimension, if you're just going back and forth and along the x-axis, it's either in the plus or minus direction. So in the absence of friction, it turns out all objects tend to move with constant velocity. So we're gonna talk about this in chapter three, but that's called Newton's first law of motion. Um, here we have a position time graph. Um, and this, is the equation of motion, which I will just say, it sort of reminds me of an equation from math, which is y equals uh, b plus mx. Everything's a bit mixed up because right now x is on the vertical axis. X is, x is the y in this case, and t is the x. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit complicated, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to measure the, the motion that's horizontal by plotting that on, a, on the vertical axis. But the point is that this, uh, this is x sub zero. It's the, what we would call the y-intercept. Okay? So it's where the object was at the time t equals zero. And so this d average is equal to the slope. And so if you took, which is equal to the rise over the run. And so like delta x divided by delta t in this case. So if you went from here to here, this would this distance would be the delta t. And this distance uh, would be the delta x. And so the units, it's weird. You're, I said distance, but what I really meant is time on the horizontal. So the units of this slope are going to be uh, meters divided by uh, seconds because right, you're taking um, the delta x on the on vertical axis, which is in units of meters, um, and then you're taking dividing it by the delta t. So it's, a, it's sort of a um, bit of an abstract concept, but meters per, we call this um, meters per second. And so I tried to show it over there on the track, of constant velocity, I turned off the fan and let the, the track, the cart roll. But I don't know if you noticed, it sort of was slowing down a little bit. And in fact, there was a bit of gravity. One object that is traveling at a constant velocity is called Voyager 1. You can go on this website, again, it'll be in the, in the slides that I showed, which shows what now is the, constant, was the, is the distance of Voyager from the sun. You can see it's right now at 150 astronomical units where you know, Earth is at one astronomical unit from the sun. This is 150 times further away from the sun than the Earth right now, just going farther and farther. And this is a satellite that was launched back in the 70s, you know, escaped the Earth's, uh, escaped the whole solar system, is now out in interplanetary space, just traveling along um, at 15 kilometers per second. So every second, Voyager 1 is 15 kilometers further out in the galaxy. And it's going at a constant velocity. So let's do another poll here. If the position versus time graph of an object moving in one dimension is a straight line, what does this mean? A, the object's not moving. B, the object's moving with a constant velocity. Or C, the object's moving with a constant acceleration. What do you think? Okay, about 90% of you have clicked in, so I'm gonna give you another five seconds. So the survey says, 
61% uh, of you voted for A, 39% voted for B, and 7% voted for C. So, the actual answer that I was looking for, and this is a little tricky, was B. And so, hello? hello? Yeah, Pius has uh, his mute off. So there's a little bit of. Well, you know, I'm sure that's what it is. Um, and yes, I, can, I can actually change. I can change his email. Um, you see Your mute is off. And yeah, it's just I in the next room. Not, I mean, I told ICS this, and they said, oh, we're happy that works for you. And well, yeah, maybe I can mute him. That it may work for everybody. Yeah. Um, and then I can just change it to something else. Like, you know, yep. Figured it out. Okay, sorry about that. So back to this. Um, so it is true, actually, A is true that it could be if the straight line is also horizontal, okay? But I didn't say horizontal, I said straight. So I guess maybe it's a little bit of a, um, uh, a choice of words there, okay? I mean, you might've been thinking that straight line is, is also horizontal like that. I think B is the best answer there and um, a cons if the acceleration was zero, then that would C would also be true. So all, all three of them have some, some merit there. So a curved line on the X versus T graph means that it's not constant velocity. So um, V sometimes is called the instantaneous velocity. And there's an example where I didn't really put an arrow on the top of it. Um, this is also known as the velocity. If we leave off the word instantaneous, we're meaning what is the velocity at a particular um, instant. So for example, if you're thinking right here, you drop a tangent to that line and then measure the slope of the tangent. So this would be your um, the sort of delta x and your delta t. And so v is the slope of the tangent to the curve. And um, it also, V is called the time derivative. A little bit of calculus there. If you know some calculus of um, position. Another poll question here. Here are the position versus time graphs for two objects, A and B. So at what time do objects A and B have the same velocity? A is zero seconds, B is one second, uh, C is three seconds, D is five seconds, and E would be objects A and B never have the same velocity. So let me launch it. Okay, let's end the polling. So most of you were answering um, C, T equals three seconds. And that's exactly what I was looking for. So if you can imagine at this three second mark, you can see that A always has the same velocity, but that would be the position right about where, sort of the best answer, where I think the tangent of this curved B line is the same slope as the constant slope for A. This brings us to acceleration. And I'll end this lecture with just a little bit of talking about acceleration. Um, velocity can be thought of as the time derivative of position, sort of a slope. Acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity. So this one, what you were doing is uh, meters per second. 
So if you do another like slope, then you end up with meters per second per second. So it's also called meters per second squared. It's sort of a weird concept. Some people call it like the speed of the speed, whatever that means, but it's maybe how fast, fast changes. Very tricky concept, but it's very important um, for you to, to wrap your head around. And, you know, acceleration is as different a concept of, from velocity as velocity is different from position. Um, so, like, you know, you wouldn't think uh, um, velocity and position, you know they're not the same, right? So where something is, is not the same as how fast it's going. Well, in the same sense, if you have velocity and acceleration, the acceleration of an object is not the same as how fast it's going. So it is possible to be momentarily stopped and have non-zero acceleration. So here's a constant acceleration. So now we're doing a plot of velocity versus time. And there's a little bit of an integral there. But um, what this just means, um, this means the area. Don't have to worry too much about that. Um, but here is an equation of constantly changing um, velocity. So the slope here is A. Okay, and then the, the y-intercept here is going to be v0, I guess, the initial velocity. Okay. And then, so this, it turns out that this area here, um, from here to here, for example, this big long area, um, will be the, the change in position. So area of this equals the change in position. And I don't have much time left, um, but you can actually split it up into two rectangles here where you can say, um, so this x is going to be x0 plus um, v0 times t, that's the area of this little rectangle on the bottom, plus one half um, of t, this is t going from here to here, um, one half base times the height, where the height is sort of this change in delta v. Okay, and so um, that's also equal to, whoops. I mean, there's a better derivation probably in the textbook, but it's going to be x0 plus v0t plus, oops, times t, plus one half times t times a t. So this is x0 plus v0t t plus one half a t squared, just rearranging all that. Like basically you're adding the area of a rectangle plus the area of that triangle. So that's pretty much it for today. Um, I wanted to say, uh, we're gonna skip, the, we'll do that next time. Today's office hour and uh, help center, I'm gonna turn off the recording in about a minute. Um, I will linger actually on this Zoom for the next 20 minutes before I go to gather town. Feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you and we can, can have a chat. Um, and then at 1220, I'm going to be shifting over to Gather Town for a few minutes, at which point then the TA from this course will be, uh, be able to, um, to help you out all the way to, to 1.30. You just have to walk around and find them. But before we go, um, before on Friday, I want you to think, between now and Friday, think of an example of an object with a negative acceleration that is speeding up. Is it possible? Also try to think of an example of an object with a positive acceleration, which is slowing down. And lastly, think of an example of an object with zero velocity, which is accelerating. So thanks, and I'll see you Friday. <laughs>